Hey everybody, this is another post Collab Talk Tweet Jam takeaways. I'm here with John. Hello. Hello. How's it going? It's great. And this was how was your first Collab Talk Tweet Jam experience? I really enjoyed it. I I've always watched it happen and kind of wondered if there was more to it than just, you know, you asking and people answering. I didn't know, so I never jumped in, but I'm glad you reached out to me and kind of gave me the rundown on how simple it was because it was and and I had a blast. Like not only making the answers, but just, you know, reading through what everyone else was saying and interacting with it. I had a blast, man. Well, that's that's half the fun right there, the side questions. I always, I, like, remind people the one thing. So anybody can jump in. So if you ever see it going on with the clap talk, clap talk hashtag and be like, what are they talking about? Go check out the blog, the questions. Feel free to jump in and participate. It's not scary. No. You know? But, but just uh, those side conversations is reminding people – Always include the question number, always include the hashtag because we track everything. We do uh, some sentiment analysis around that with the Tidegraph tools. Nice. And it's, it's cool to have that, you know, historic documents of the documented co conversation as well. Well, totally. let's, let's jump in. Today, we were talking about something that I know is perfect topic for you and I. We're both in this space, the evolution of community. And this was kind of sparked by the announcement a couple weeks back that the formerly known as SharePointSaturday.org or SPS events is shutting down this centralized site. And that that just kind of prompted me. It's like, I, I don't want to talk for an hour just about that. But let's talk about what's actually happening with community. And that it came up, of course. It's an important question. But uh, so a lot of we had a great panel. It was very active. We can always tell when we're getting a lot of Twitter activity in general, because you start to see the paid ads come in, you start to see outside groups. You know, we have for some of the topics, we trend nationally or even globally on Twitter. Um, but with that, yeah, so we'll probably get like three or four million impressions out of this one hour event. So some pretty wow. serious numbers. But it, you know, around this this topic, so question number one, we started things off with, how did you first get involved in community? What is your origin story? I had to go comic book on us. So. Yeah, I like so what's that. Your, what's your start? Mine was gaming, uh, PC gaming, really. Uh, the early days of the internet. I, I was like 16 or 17. I built a PC, you know, picked out all the parts, learned how to build it myself, and then started playing Quake 3. And uh, and that was my my oh, yeah. first gaming community. And and gaming communities, if you've ever been a part of one, they give you the full gamut, right? Like there's positivity and there's some real toxicity. There's people helping each other and there's people hating each other. And so uh, for me, it all started with gaming and this idea of like, holy cow, I could I could actually organize people virtually around things that I'm interested in. And so that all it was just a, an addiction from there for me. You know, I have to say that, uh, uh, so in a little bit later, the, I, I tried the timing of the products, but when Unreal Tournament came out, I yeah. was working for a startup. And this is a great, I, again, I think it builds on that comment on community building uh, is, so we were a startup, so venture capital backed uh, just south of San Francisco. And at the end of the day, so usually about 6 p.m., uh, they would, er, the majority of people would leave, the commuters would depart. I live far across the, the a bridge on the East Bay, and I'm like, I don't want to leave quite yet. I'll work later. And they started uh, playing Unreal Tournament yes. internally. And so you'd have the, like the developer pods, these areas and the support pods and other parts of the building where uh, you would hear teams and they were like talking together. And we would actually go spy on each other to find out where the other <laughs> were in the map of things. And we would sit and play. And our CIO, Don Witt, was hilarious that we had this giant screen of these massive monitors all put together for one giant screen. And he's always, that's my screen. And he'd be playing there. And we're like, be like, well, we know where Don is because he's playing with his screen in front of everybody and go up and, <laughs> and you know, kill him on screen, you know. Uh, but it, it's like the first stream snipe. But yeah, exactly. But it was it was a just a fantastic way for us to build community through that 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 joint activity. We're all doing that thing. We're all gathered together. It wasn't work related. It was the you know the fun side of that as well. And where we built so many long friendships. I'm still that was in 2001. I'm still playing with uh, playing with games with 
in contact with people that were part of that original team because yeah. of so many of those kinds of interactions. I uh, I still keep in contact with three of my friends from way back when. Like I was 16, one of them was 12, one was 17, and one was 14. Like we we still talk today. We we wish each other happy birthday. I still game with one of them occasionally. Like it's it's lifelong connection and and very similar to you know the community that we're both a part of here i feel it's that that same idea right you meet people around this shared idea and and it does connect you over time well there's a uh, it, it, i think there's so many people that you know coming from as a sharepoint mvp and kind of come up with the sharepoint community and how vibrant that was um that uh, uh, there are so many people that became friends around the SharePoint conference in 2009, like that specific event. And I have a long list of people that I met at that event that I'm still friends with and I connect with uh, uh, at least on a weekly basis. I love so, it. Yeah, it's, it's powerful. Well, question number two says, with so many online events, what do you predict will be the future of in-person events? Mm. Uh, so I, I have a, a different take on this. Like, I think a lot of people are like, oh, we're going to go in person, full power. I just believe the future is hybrid. It, it can't be anything else. Like, of course, we want that in person feeling. I want to come and give you a hug. I want to I want to hang out and talk and drink and, and, and spend those moments together outside of the conference. Right. The sessions don't matter. It's the being together. But I think what we will also see is that you know look at microsoft right look at look at ignite or build pre-pandemic and look at their attendance numbers right and then look at their attendance numbers in the well, virtual world tenfold magnitude right. yeah. magnitude of tenfold Crazy numbers right, right. It's, I, I think i think for build and and ignite like definitely makes sense where i the, the difficulty that i have my my primary event for my business and I just love the event is the partner conference. So it was Inspire in, in July, formerly the Worldwide Partner Conference. You cannot do that event virtually. You just cannot do it. It's about P2P, partner to partner. And how do you do that? How do you build a business? How do you make the connections and do it in the virtual? I mean, you think about it this way. It's like there are, as I'm not disagreeing with you. In fact, we, we kind of started to have a side conversation on this topic. Yeah. I believe that the model needs to change. It's hybrid, but what that actually looks like. Because you look at what's happening with online events now, you have 15 to 30 minute presentations, so much shorter segments mm -hmm. than you're doing live. And so much of it in the Microsoft, you know, the, the, the OEM content that's coming out is so heavily marketing focused rather than true deep dives in on the technology which yeah. is more of what the in-person event content you know was right uh, and so figuring out what that looks like and what that mixes and providing opportunities to, to interact while still providing that additional value for the people that show up in person i mean i just think that's where it needs to evolve and change i agree i think there's a there's a platform shift that needs to happen where how do we close the gap between the in-person and virtual experience? And I think there are, I, I have some ideas on that for sure. But I think the other part of it that actually came up in the conversation that someone else had mentioned was, there also has to be a paradigm shift in how the employer and the company thinks about an employee's time at a virtual event versus mm -hmm. an in-person event. Like yeah. I can think for myself at an in-person event, no one bothered me. I blocked the calendar, I'm gone, I'm there. Everyone respected that. A virtual event, I'm kind of expected to keep working while attending, right? And so I think that that's a major piece that we have to shift as well to say, awesome, like we are happy to provide a virtual experience, but it needs to have priority in in you know comparison to a in person event as well. Right. No, I completely agree. I mean, I even like the idea. I'm trying to think which event did this where they had like the 30 minute segments. Uh, of content so you could dial into that and then the the back half of the hour they had a separate kind of like a roundtable feedback session and so nice. if you're watching this remotely i mean you could log into that and then you could go and jump off do some things check other things come back for the next content or stay and participate in the second half where it's an in-depth it's a conversation it's a roundtable discussion 
on that that topic. Um, so uh, yeah, I agree. There there needs to be something there, and maybe that's having helped with the North American Collaboration Summit in Branson, Missouri. The last two years, I helped uh, uh, organize and manage the online and in room the moderators for the hybrid experience, and it was fantastic having somebody physically in the room so that people online, if they ask questions, there's someone in the room that on their behalf, raise their hand and ask a question so that they don't, don't or they feel like they're being responded to that they're in, it's interactive. But likewise, it might be that the you do the short in-person segment and then you allow then the conversation to happen with that online moderator for the people that, that are there. So I think I think I lean more towards that second part. Like I don't want to. Again, I I'm actually building something. I I decided that this is the future, and in my spare time, I'm trying to build an experience that will transform how this is done. And so I don't want to give away too much secret sauce, but yeah. imagine that the people attending and the people at home virtually both were experiencing in the same way. Maybe the person in attendance instead of raising their hand and asking the question, asks it through an app, which everyone is now seeing, that then is relayed to the speaker who answers the question for everyone. And now suddenly we've we've shrunk the gap of the experience a bit. And if we take a few other pieces of, of live event and think of how we can involve that digital person in the same way, now I think we're really moving towards something that people would use and would think of differently and would encourage participation with because it's not a cheap experience. It's not a different experience. It's the same experience that the person who's attending gets. And so I, I really think there's some great possibility there. And I think that the future has to be hybrid because you can't just ignore all the people that you've now brought into the fold and say, oh, sorry, we're going back to person. You can't afford it. Not right. our problem, right? Well, there's, I mean, so one other aspect that before we move on to the next one, like we're talking about, um, so we had rebranded our SharePoint Saturday events here in Utah. A couple of years back, we changed it to Microsoft 365, and then we moved it to Friday and doubled our numbers. But that's like a cultural thing here in Utah and people's weekends and how they spend their time. And so it wasn't surprising to us that it increased the numbers. But anyway, with that, with that, that move, we talked about, um, there's a certain number of people that are presenting and saying, look, we don't want our content to be recorded. Uh, we don't want it to be, we want it to be there for in the room. Like they're, mm -hmm. so these are, these are professional speakers, you know, experts on it that, you know, they're like, if we give it all away for free, then no one's going to hire me as a consultant and that side of it. And there's value add for having a certain amount of content and topics that are only there for in person, but then making other the keynotes and other sessions available for the online experience. That's another aspect of, of hybrid where you have to think about what is the experience and the value being provided to those people that are dialing in? Yeah. What is the experience for those people and the value that you're providing that show up to that? And if you want to have that hybrid and not just say it's the same for everybody, you know, then you have a difficult Here. time getting sponsors, paying for the venue, doing anything in person, and then lose the value of the person to person or or Very partner. Fair. Partner. Anyway, no, I, I love this. We, space. Yeah, we can talk about this for hours. I feel like okay. no, that's <laughs> that's a topic we could go in depth on. Yeah. Well, the next one. So, was specifically going back to SPS events. So, what will the community impact of SPS events? shutting down what will be the community impact and does community need a centralized site or service to survive so first question sps events closing down like brings a tear to my eye like i love them i i my best events were sharepoint saturday events where i spoke to a room of like 35 people right it's intimate it's personal it's fun you connect with them on a different level um and so for me, like, it's a sad thing to see them go. Now, on the other hand, do I say that it's the end of events for community? Like, no, absolutely not. I think we already see other groups rising up to fill the place, right? Like before the pandemic, D365 Saturday was going hot, right? Like all over the place. And and there were a bunch of other like Cloud Saturdays and, and Azure well, Saturdays. SQL and, Saturday where we stole the model from. Exactly, we, right. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so I think those things continue on and, and, and SharePoint Saturdays is like a, it's not a, it's not a dying. It's not a death. It's just a transfer of energy, right? Like it's the end of an era, but I do believe that something else will come and rise and take its place. And does community need a central location? No, it doesn't. I don't think it does. The only, uh, I, I agree. I like, because there are so many things that are out there and there are more and more like we had even gone and, and built our site, you know, outside of the platform because it didn't, didn't quite fit, you know, yep. the model of what SharePoint Saturday was. And that was part of, I think the beginning of the end of, of the change for that. Um, but one thing that's lacking is the the idea of like a centralized calendar, number one, and then you know, and I I always de define it as like the cross pollinating of ideas and people and resources, the sharing of those across a community. Again, yeah. where do you collect all that information? Uh, and then you know, three is. Um, you know, to be able to have visibility over a broad range of things. Like I'm now checking the tech community calendar. I'm checking uh, the, uh, you know, some of the, like the user group activities. People have heard about things. There's, the, you know, meetup activities and things that are out there. I get yeah. Eventbrite in, invitations. So all of these pieces are all over the place. And, and so one thing that made one powerful thing about the SharePoint community, again, is that we had that centralized place to go to and see what was coming up and that you knew that, hey, we want to do something or, you know, we want to yeah. make sure that it's part of this and is on that calendar invisible. I can feel that. I, I, so ex I, except for that. <laughs> no, and, and I think that's fair. I think um, I do see the power in it, right? Having experienced it and, and scheduled several events in a year based on that one calendar myself, I definitely hear you. I think it's it's interesting though to look at like community and how the like centralized user groups have gone, right? Like the evidence of that is that it ends. And so how do we maintain that centralization from one era to the next, I guess is the problem because like, you know, the the like DCI user groups, those all went away right now. SharePoint Saturday user groups going away. And and it's not that they're going away, it's that they're the energy is moving to a different place. It's right. an individual having a group. It's on meetup, like you said, or Eventbrite. And so does the community want centralization? I think is the question I ask, because there are so many differing opinions and centralization requires regulation. And I think there's so many people who want to do it their own way and don't right. want that regulation. But there has to be, right. Because if you're going to have, if I'm going to be responsible, whether I'm neutral or I work for a company, well, whoever it is, put it, you have to have some kind of oversight, some lightweight governance around it to make sure that because what inevitably happens, and and think of this like the some of the Facebook community, uh, uh, you know, the topic, the community areas in Facebook, the teams mm -hmm. are huge. There's like forty to sixty thousand people within like the teams community, the teams for education, separate, yep. equally big, the SharePoint community, kind of all those things. And it without somebody monitoring, what you quickly get is spam on that list. Promotion, yeah, right. It's all the, the uh, well, we're doing the, our company's doing this, this webinar, which may or may not be related to SharePoint. And so you have to have policies yeah. in, in place and regulate that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I, I see like, you know, the power platform team uh, is spinning up that user group thing, trying to do that, trying to give a central place, but having been part of that journey and now being able to talk about it candidly, there was a lot of people who just didn't want it, who were like, we don't care about your model. We're going to do it our way. And like, and so I think should there be it is one question and does the community want it, I guess is another question. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I, Hey, I think, honestly, I think it's cyclical. I think we'll, we'll see, what this looks like and something will, I mean, you're right. Something is going to evolve and change and, and come out of this. And if there's yeah. great enough need, if there's enough confusion out there in the chaos, something will, you know, go back together. The big bang went out and now it's, you know, come back together and we'll then yep. explode again out. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm of the opinion at the very least, you know, a, a community calendar, but then 
I know what it, I, the reality of what it takes to maintain that and add to it and all get people promoting it. So they're looking at it. So I get it. It's you know, big, who I'm going to give a, a shameless plug for a friend of mine, uh, sure. Matt Wade, that Matt Wade on Twitter. He does a good job of actually trying to create a calendar of all the community events and all the Microsoft events. He has it on his website. He links it out. And yeah. uh, and so you can look him up. I'm sure it's pretty easy to find on his Twitter. He's he has the closest yeah. to a uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for to an overview of all the events that I've seen. Well, and that is so, and there have been others less, and I've utilized Matt's as well. It, it, there have been other attempts to go and do that from time to time by different vendors. And when I when I kind of got in this space before SharePoint Saturday SPS events became what it is, um, there were a couple other uh, vendors uh, ISVs that were trying to do the same thing. So again, I think we'll something will kind of grow out of that to to fill that need. So. Totally. So the next question, number four, was what tools and resources do you rely on for building and supporting your community efforts? Yeah, so this one I, I answered a bit more as like a community builder. Um, and and I have a, a, a few different places and tools that I use. And I'm going to actually go and pull this up because I wrote it down. Because I was like, when I wrote it, I was like, oh, I should write that somewhere. That's useful. Um, so I think I use social media a lot for inspiration. Um, it's really the conversation, the hype, trying to get you interested, right? Um, I use the community websites for information. You have a problem, go here. That's where we get our problem solved. Uh, I create engagement programs for competition and collaboration. I use data for personalization. I use ideas for feedback and then meetups or user groups for connection. And so I think, you know, thinking of it from that builder perspective, there's all these different programs and tools, and then also why I want these programs and tools involved in the community. Um, and so I think those those are the big ones for me. Yeah, it, it's funny. It's like I, I uh, so I, I mentioned on there with some of my community beginnings, my origin story back into the early 90s and uh, in late 90s, uh, you know, was really involved with user groups and I had my own software startup and what we were trying to go in and do and build. But the the nonprofit that I co-founded in 2002, and at the time you had all this the social media, the network tools. You had the, some of the early versions of those, and LinkedIn was brand new. I'm like I'm in the like the five or six thousand wow. numbers, Mike. So I was part of the the, the beta, so very early yes. there. But there were different social platforms out there. There was one called Rise R Y Z E, which I think there's a shell of it that's still out there, HTML based, very simplistic. But yeah. it had bigger numbers than anybody else. It was huge uh, at, at the time, and all the great work that Adrian Scott did around that. But uh, he, so the what we as we started to build this nonprofit, and we realized well we needed to have a centralized location for you know, a, a website, a page for all of our activities. We needed to have the registration. We, it was a mess of a process to, to do any kind of call for speakers, uh, as we all yeah. know. And yeah. so you, you think about kind of all those, those core pieces, a place to go that has all the information around it. Of course, promotion with all the social tools that are out there. So you either need a website or like we did, for a user group, we had our paid meetup subscription. So we kind of, we stopped using our website. Yeah. We just did a redirect to our meetup and we're using meetup less and less now where we, you know, we have just other methods to reach the tool. We got our our, our mailing list and we could just via social push this out there. Yeah. Um, but Sessionize has become our de facto yeah, for the call to speakers. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. Thank God for Session Eyes. My goodness, yeah. what a great tool. I have to say, I have absolutely no idea what it costs. If you have a paid event, I yep. don't know what it costs to use Session Eyes. That's so $599 a year, which is not bad at all. That's not bad at all. No, nope. so you do a massive event, that is a huge headache to take off of your, 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 your mind, you know, nope. take away that great pain. For... Nope. Free events for nonprofit activities, you can get sessionized for free. And so you have to request it, but they'll they'll, they'll provide that. So if you're doing a, a free community-driven event, you'd be a fool not to use sessionize for your call for speakers and totally. organize that and select that. Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, that, that that's it. It's, it, you know, social for promotion. And it's yep. the word of mouth that is 
the most powerful tool there. But yeah, I, and I know that there are still some people that will, like, it's important if you're doing an event that you have paid sponsors for and you're paying for food for, if you're doing an in-person event, yeah. Eventbrite is also something that we use just to be able to kind of uh, put some responsibility on people when you're registering for it. You get the reminders automatically for those yeah. things. I just love really Eventbrite. Like it. It's, uh, I think, it, I wasn't allowed to use it during my time with Microsoft, but I did anyways because it was such a great tool. I think even outside of how it's a communication engine inside of it where you can consistently communicate with your audience, the other beautiful part is they market it for you and they have an amazing marketing engine. You get a ton. If, you, if you're able to create any hype for your own event, their marketing engine will match the amount of hype that you are able to produce. And so in some of the events I have run on Eventbrite, I've gotten thousands of extra attendees due to their marketing efforts. You have to say that that is one huge benefit of Eventbrite. To some degree, you get some benefit, network benefit, the scale through Meetup, only because whatever event you put on there that anybody, it makes it visible to anybody within yeah. the system. And so you could just go and look at geography based, like what are all of the events happening in the next 30 days here in the Salt Lake City area? And I could see, oh, I had no idea. That's really interesting. And so I've got and participated in some of those things and promoted. So that's the benefit of going back to the benefit of having that centralized thing, but but having it still disjoint. It's not centralized that's specific to a community and individual. That's a platform where they provide that. Yeah. But for again, for a free event, uh, Eventbrite, you, you can use it's it free. for free. Yeah. Meetup, uh, if you there are some free capabilities, but if you have, you know, they they charge. And the minimum is 50 bucks a month for like ongoing usage of it. So just be aware that there's a cost there. Nice. Uh, let's see. So we're on question number five. Here we go. What help should Microsoft and other partners or sponsors provide to the community? So what help is essential versus nice to have? I think that Microsoft, I, I really tried very hard to create this idea of sharing the stage, sharing the platform. I created the community conference and Chuck on my team did community calls. And there's, I think that what, what Microsoft should recognize is they're big enough. Like if they spent less on marketing and more on community uplift, they would get a lot more for their return because you can see the direct outcome. If you go talk to anyone in the Power Platform community and you say, are you a part of this because of the activity of the community team or the marketing team? I would I would be very confident to say that nine out of 10 times, they would not choose the marketing team. Now that's not to slight the marketing team. They do their job, they do what they're supposed to do. But I think that what we've seen is we've seen explosive moments within the platform when we have focused on community. Look at Samit. Look at Samit's story and Ignite 2018 and how that one individual story of, of rags to riches, of, of coming from nothing to standing on stage with Satya, it allowed so many people to see themselves in this idea of the platform and what it could do for them. I, I believe that that was our single most pivotal moment. And that was not a marketing thing. That right. was a community thing, right? And and so I think they should, and, and so there's a lot of great people there doing a great job, trying their hardest to do it. I just think that the machine is not quite there yet. It's still very marketing focused. Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things I love uh, that I do, uh, kind of a segment of my Collab Talk podcast, as I do the MVP buzz chat. So I interview MVPs around the world from all different technology areas within the ecosystem. And uh, the, the last few weeks, I've interviewed quite a few like brand new MVPs that just got their award and saw my open invitation to come and participate and be like, yeah, tell tell their, their origin story around that. And how many of those people that it was like, well, what was your path? And the first place that almost everybody says is, is like, well, I got involved with my local user group and I 
after like a year, I got the, you know, my nerves together to present just a short segment there to my user group. And that was in front of like 15, 20 people. And, and then I, you know, I reached out and did in that, that they got on their path to, yeah. and that's the power of community around that. Totally. From Microsoft's perspective, two things, because I know you were just, were at Microsoft and you saw part of this. And I'd say that the difference with Microsoft is when you have people like yourself in your former role that get community and get involved the right way, the right level, and and helping raise up others versus somebody at Microsoft in marketing you know, says, hey, we've got an opportunity here. Let's go do community. And they like take it over and try and productize it and KPI everything. And then it just, and then question, well, it didn't work for us. It was like, right. well, you did it wrong. Right. You know, instead of just right. letting, letting loose. But I'll tell you from, from having been out in the field um, and uh, uh, tried trying to uh, get the local field office of Microsoft, somebody to show up. It, I, so I helped run, uh, uh, start the SharePoint Saturday Utah, like almost this is like eight, nine years ago. And only like the last in person or two back did a local Microsoft person actually show up. Yeah. And he showed up because he had just left the field from a partner and went to work for Microsoft and was still very community centric, but that he understood that. And yeah. was involved within IAMCP, which is the International Association of Microsoft Channel Partners. So he was focused on the partner side as well as the community side. So he got it. But getting, you know, we we were never asking for funds. We were able to build it. But just getting Microsoft to be aware of it and then help us get the word out. We're not yeah. asking for a list. We're saying you, Microsoft, Push put us in the out. newsletter. Put us in the newsletter. Share. Yeah. Let, let the regional folks here in Utah that Microsoft employees know that it's going on and tell their customers yeah. that it's coming up. I mean, it's it's just like pulling teeth, trying to get this through. And uh, and so what I would change about this is something, and this could be for any partner, any ISV, any consulting company that's in the in the community. Get involved, not because there is a direct line from, I was involved in this event, therefore I did this much new business. Sometimes creating goodwill, there's a long-term effect. Attribution of those activities can be very difficult and take a long time. But I, I, I so many stories that I have where partners that were never there physically, but would send 250 bucks to sponsor and uh, and send some swag to give away at the event that we're doing or at the user group. Um, how many times people have asked for, hey, what's the contact information? Or I've got questions about. They know the brand, they know the name because of their support for the community activities. Yeah. And a lot of times, I mean, we need you know Microsoft and other OEMs and ISVs and SIs to step up and do the same thing, help the community so we can keep doing this stuff and help us keep then those brands, you know, front well, of mind. They, they just need to recognize that community is not selling products or services. Community is selling a vision, right? We are, we are bringing people together around a commonality, a vision of where we are headed together and what this means to us. And so if they can understand that their value add is not in direct sales or services, but instead of getting to be part of saying, I'm also selling that vision, I think there's a long-term benefit to, to, to being part of that, where when you are in the community and trusted and give of yourself, people will just say like, oh, hey, you know, that that Kent, he's a good guy. Like, he, I'm going to send him some business because he's always so helpful. And I've seen that a million times. And oftentimes when people come ask me who are the partners they should engage with, it's not the the big ones. It's it's all the ones who are in the community who are actively participating because they like to be there because they believe in the vision. You know, one of the most common things against community that I hear from from partners, and I've heard it from some in my own current company, although we're you know we understand we've got a lot number of people, you know, five MVPs, three RDs, oh, yeah. very plugged oh, yeah. in. We get community; they're very supportive of those that are more community minded. Um, but I've heard this statement of that uh, you know, I was like, well, 
you know, the people that write the checks, the the decision makers tend to not go to community groups and user groups and these community driven events, which is true. Yeah. However, however, when the CIO is going to write a check on a solution and he's trying to validate, do we know this? Who do they go to? They go to the individuals within their organization. Do you know this brand? Do you know their solution? Like, oh yeah, I know their company well. I've, I've seen it. I know their MVP. I know their technical team. I've met them and talked to them at the last SharePoint Saturday. Like having those kinds of connections makes a huge difference. Again, marketing attribution is hard. Yep. So you, you have to be a bit more creative than saying simply because decision makers are not going to the event, therefore, Let's not go to the event. Well, and decision makers are informed by who? Who comes back to the business and says, I have this idea. We're going to do it this way. Then the decision maker has an opportunity to say yes or no. But where is their whole perspective created by? Right. right? And, yeah. and so, yeah, I, I laugh at that statement. And I would. I know. And yet I hear it all the time, all the time. So, well, uh, so the next question six was. What are your best practices for growing community, whether locally, regionally, or globally? Oh, this is one we had a bit of a side chat on as well, and I think we could go deep forever. Um, I think you, again, as a, I answer this as a community builder and not as a community participant, but I think it's about creating compelling experiences at each stage of community opportunity. I think there's like these, it's broken up into four stages, right? Discover, first you discover this community. So how do I create a compelling experience in the discover phase? Well, I help that user get to the information they need as quickly as possible. That's the most compelling I can be because when I have something broken, I don't care what your featured stories are or who your best users are. I just need to fix this thing, right? Then there's an onboard stage where now maybe your problem's fixed and I need to ask you to stay around, to keep you around. So how do I create experiences or incentivization that gets you to come back to me, right? So how do I get you to come fill out your profile? How do I get you to click on something in the newsletter? How do I get you back and, and do it in a way that seems inspiring or fun to you? Then from there, it's engagement. And how do I get you further engaged? How do I get you to a user group? How do I get you to speak at a user group? How do I get you to, to answer another person's question in the community or give us an uh, idea in, in, in uh, user voice, right? There's a, a next level of things. How do I make these fun? How do I incentivize or gamify those things? And then finally, how do I make you become a leader? How do I incentivize, right? So Microsoft does a great job at this with the MVP program, right? They have a, a, a pipeline to create influencers and they just badge them and the whole world suddenly respects this thing, right? And so that's the, that's the it's a pinnacle example. Salesforce does it too. They have an MVP program. I think that that you know idea of how we incentivize people to lead is probably the most important because you think about it all community activity is going to be hundreds of millions of people and your elite leaders will be you know a tenth of a percent of that if you're lucky if, if that yeah no it's i always say that it's uh when you're doing that you're it's about developing advocacy so if i'm building community for my my company which i do i own my champions program and helping we're expanding this and making announcements uh, you do a great job by the way i see your so, champions oh, all over yeah, there, there's because we have some people that are you know, like individuals as individuals, they just do a fantastic job around there. And we're trying to go in and try and do some more programmatic things, which, again, I'm, it, exactly to your point is as a company, we're looking at we're we're falling short on opportunities that we're giving our champions to go and to show show off like mm -hmm. we want to give them more tools that they can go and leverage to go and do more around it. We don't have to you know, explicitly say, it's like, and hey, we're doing this because AdPoint will sell more software around that. It's like, well, no, that's that's not the reasons around it, but we have that natural with the, through the community, you know, anybody that goes and builds community this way, like there's a, there's that implied back end of the sponsor, <laughs> sponsoring organizations around that. Totally. But it's, it, it's the idea of that, you know, a, the, a rising tide floats all boats by, Helping the community and doing that. I love that saying. I love that you said that. I use that all the time. I, I love so that. So do I. I love that as well. And I don't even know the origin of that. I don't either. I, I now don't now either. we need to go look that up. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, so it's the idea that you're doing it, again, because you're building goodwill. And there's so much 
so many opportunities that will happen for you as the participating company. This goes back to the last question with why Microsoft should try to find ways to do more to support community is because the benefits of it long term far outweigh the short term cost or the limited awareness of KPIs for this quarter oh. for this and it's like it's it's only an upfront investment, right? Like if you do it right, over time you make less and less investment because the community learns the patterns and takes things over. And right. so you don't need it. And and so you're man, I we could go on for hours again on this well, one. I, so I shared I, I'll simplify it in it. So I did a blog post last week where I shared is something that I actually developed for my nonprofit back in the early 2000s. I used when I was at Microsoft and I was part of the Microsoft excellence community, the, or the management excellence community. So kind of the people managers, and I was actually the evangelist for Mac or the, the leadership team, which is called melt. Nice. And so I developed an ebook and materials around that, but is the idea, how do you build community? What I recommend as a community member and as an organizer, I'm on the board of my user group, for example, uh, is that, you know, one, bring a friend, no matter what the activity is, even if you it drove 20 people to it already, go and find one new person that's not been there actively or has never been, find them, Try make that a goal to bring one person with you every time. Think about that. If your user group, if everybody had that goal of bring somebody with them, right. Magnitudes. So yeah, the second one is uh, to get involved, like have a, have a, a role within that. And so volunteer for that. When people have a job, when they have a role, when they feel that they're part of it somewhere, like make up roles in is it easier <laughs> for that. Like, hey, you can do this. People then become committed. They stick around for that. You make that sticky. And then the third thing is, as an individual, is like have a learning plan. Know what you want to get out of it. It's all right that, uh, you know, sometimes the topics are just not of interest to me, but I continue to stay involved because the community aspect, I learned something new that I wasn't looking for. But then, of course, I really glom on focused on those things that I'm, you know, I make sure that I'm there for the topics that I really care about. So well, I heard someone say a, a great piece to add on to that. Well, uh, it's called active listening. And, and even though something may not be directly related to me. I can actually listen to it with my own problem in mind, and I will be able to derive certain value because all problems are pretty similar, right? And and are solved through similar patterns. And so thinking of it in that way, you can still find value, even if you don't care what the topic is. You know, I, I so I had a very snarky response. I had a manager, manager who just did not understand, did not appreciate community activities. And I was doing things on my lunch and on weekends and, you know, my, my own time. And this manager said to me, he's like, well, I don't see the value in you participating in the community stuff. Cause I was talking about like something I was doing and I'm like, you know, and, and, and I, I already went back and said, it's like, th that's my time. It's none of your business. What I, yeah. what I do, how I spend my time and I'm, I'm learning to help it is like, so I don't see any direct impact to our business by you participating in that group. And my snarky response was, I remember this cause I chose my words and I said, I'm not so selfish as to think that I personally have to get something out of every interaction. So many times it's not mm -hmm. about what I'm getting out of it. I have information, I have experience that can help others. And I know that I'll get something out of this over the long term, but it's that. all about helping others. I love that. And, and, and brands could do a good job by recognizing that people trust people, yeah. right? And, and that kind of activity only lends to their further credibility. I would say that that manager did not like that response. Yeah, uh, really so, <laughs> so, so the last, the last question. Uh, so what are your community building plans going forward? Ah, yes. Uh, the exciting future. So I'm here at DocuSign now. I've been here for about six months. It's been an interesting landing journey and team building. So I have two people on my team. I'm set to hire three more in the next year. And we are setting a whole new vision for community and evangelism at DocuSign. There traditionally was not very much of it to speak of. And so we're rethinking a whole website right now. How do the products have information? How does user voice tie in? What's our gamification strategy? How 
will we host community video and blogs? And so right now we're getting to basically vision all that and, and put it together. And so we'll be building that experience through the winter here, hopefully for a soft launch early next year. And, uh, and so that's kind of where I'm at. And then personally, outside of my professional realm, I, I'm a big gamer, you know, I've, I've always been, my, my origin story was there. It's something that's persisted throughout my life. And I've decided- some of, first, some of the first few live streams things, the things that I saw was you doing gaming stuff. So that was some of the first content that I saw of yours. Yeah, yeah. And, and I had this weird thing where for a while I decided that I couldn't do gaming content, that I, I'm a professional and I have to do professional content and, and I can't be fully me because that's too much. Uh, I changed my mind recently and I decided, no, I'm I'm going to do some gaming content. I'm going to be fully me. I'm going to 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 bring full John forward. And and so that's I'm I'm doing a lot of that community building right now around Xbox, around PC gaming. I got, you know, a little Discord server and a WhatsApp group and we talk about games every day and it just brings joy to my heart, you know? Well that that is great to to hear and go and do it. That it and that's I think that is a key element too with with MVPs that I talk with and people that are very community centric like yourself is that you know we would do this stuff without the titles regardless of you know the 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 recognition the other things that we've done because it's core it's it's part of us like I was doing interviews uh, and I think it's one of the reasons I earned my when I first became an MVP I had done over 200 videos in a series called The One Thing, where I was talking to people. It was SharePoint related. I'm a tech guy. I, in, in all of my, let me say, in almost 30 years, I spent one year consulting for, but working for a non-technology company. No. Or did not, did not like it. <laughs> did not like it at all. I'm yeah. like, now nah, I need to get back in a world where people, so like, so that's, but personally, that's how, what I enjoyed. Like I, I've had people that had commented on like the volume of content that I write from time to time. And I was like, I write to relax sometimes and to get ideas out of my brain. So yeah. the voices stop, you know, totally, <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, John really appreciate your time. Take the time out of your day around this. And thanks again for participating. Hopefully we'll see you at future club talk tweet jams. Thank you so much for having me. I will absolutely be at, I think I'm going to, I'm just going to say, I'll be at all of them from now on. Woohoo. Yeah, that's that's the spirit. Just send yeah. people again, even if they're if it's not directly relevant, I'm sure you, there are questions, there will be side conversations that come up, you be like, "Hey, I've got something to say there." That's what you they're know, all Christian, I have an opinion about everything. So, it's okay. <laughs> I could talk for hours on everything, no matter what I know about the topic. That's right. Have, that's right. I, that's a personality flaw or or maybe a, a personality trait worth worth uh, recognizing. I don't know. Either way, well, awesome. Well, thanks a lot, John. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.